The next leg of our journey found us leaving the port of Jaffa, headed for Gethsemane, uh, a garden at the base of the Mount of Olives. Normally, uh, Google Maps lists it as a drive of less than an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, the distance is only about 69 kilometers or 43 miles, but uh, the traffic at the time of day that we were traveling meant it was a much more lengthy drive. But we arrived at the beautiful location, and this is the first uh, location where Joel actually delivered a message. And we were very blessed to be sitting in the garden, uh, in the shade, and with very few other tourists around. And that uh, is kind of a blessing of being one of the first groups coming back to Israel after uh, the COVID lockdown. A little bit uh, about the garden, it's, it's called the olive press, or oil press, uh, more correctly. Um, it's covered in uh, both Mark and Matthew's Gospels. Um, and John also states that he went to a garden near the Kitterin Valley. Um, we don't know exactly the location of where Gethsemane is, but uh, it's a beautiful location. Some of the olive trees there have been radiocarbon dated back to 2,000 years. And then right next door, we went to the Church of All Nations, um, that's a church that we'll have some photos from the inside of. It's, it's an absolutely stunningly beautiful church. And so we'll pick it up with uh, Joel with his first uh, message that he shares with our group. So remind me, this is what's beautiful about having a little group like this is we don't need headsets. We, we, we can just gather together and, and it's easy to find a little spot. And it's also good as despite all the frustration with the COVID and everything, it's good because it's still, tourism hasn't really picked up and this place is a madhouse during normal working hour, you know what I'm saying? And, and so this is really pretty nice that we get this. So remind me again, how many had first time here? First time, okay, so the majority. So I'm gonna sort of share something. I think it's a good introduction. We're going to go up on the Mount of Olives. Now, you're going to have a much better vantage point up there. And in a sense, what I'm going to share right now would be a little bit more appropriate up there. Um, but you'll kind of see what I'm, what I'm explaining up there. So again, obviously, this is unarguably. So the thing, when we go places, it'll be like, well, is this really Simon? You know, is this really where this is? This is unarguably the Mount of Olives. Now, if this is precisely where Jesus was praying the night, or was it 300, you know, it's <laughs> like we're relatively close is the point. And obviously, these olive trees, what do they say about these? How old are these? These are 250. On the other side, we have a couple of thousand years old. Some, some that are as much as a few thousand years old. Olive trees are a very peculiar specimen. Um, but so it's a... There's a hundred sermons that can be preached here. But what's amazing, so let me just start here. Obviously, so much of what I'm often talking about is eschatological and so forth. One of the big texts is Jesus' Olivet Discourse. So his sermon on the last days that he gives on the Mount of Olives, right? So, you know, it's kind of nicer again if you're up there, but this is the Mount of Olives. Now, so as he's, they're, they're up on the temple, they come down and, you know, the whole thing begins and they're, they're like, man, look at that thing. It's amazing. And he goes, I'm telling you guys, the whole thing's going to be destroyed. Now, think of like if you go to like Washington, D.C. and you're doing a tour and you're like, oh, this is the Lincoln Memorial. And also the tour guide goes, I'm telling you guys, this whole thing's going to be a smoking ash heap. You know, you're like, wait, what? what? You know, like he, he just and so they but they understand the context of what he's talking about. He's talking about the consummation of the ages, the fulfillment of everything that the prophet's been talking about. And so they understand he's talking, but they go, give us some clarity on timing. So he goes into the whole sermon on the end times, you know, the all of it discourse. But one of the big passages that's often highly debated is in Matthew 25, which is still part of the all of it discourse. And um, so let me just pull it up here. Verse 31. 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory, so the primary way beyond any other title that Jesus referred to himself 70 some odd times throughout all the Gospels, way more than anything else, is by the title the Son of Man. Now, the Lord referred to Ezekiel as the Son of Man. It just means human, but that's not what Jesus meant. What Jesus was referring to is specifically Daniel 7. Which, and how do we know that he was referring to Daniel 7 and not anything else? Because Daniel 7 talks about, Daniel looks and he sees in the courtrooms of heaven, he sees one like a son of man, which means like he's an anthropomorphic form, he has two arms, two legs, he's in the form of a human, but he's coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, wait a minute, Psalm 68, right? Sing to him who rides on the clouds, Deuteronomy 33. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides on the clouds, who comes to save us. Like, so as Israel's coming up out of the promised land, they often would engage in polemical statements, which means they're mocking the false gods that they're about to defeat. So the Canaanites, the pagans that lived here in the land at the time before they were conquered, they worshiped Baal. And they said, Baal's the storm god. He's the one that rides on the clouds. And Israel goes, oh, really? So your God rides on the clouds. Have you ever seen him ride on the clouds? Because we've just followed him for, uh, you know, a, a few decades through the desert. With our eyeballs, we've seen him leading us in the cloud, in fire by night. Cloud, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're like, we've actually seen him. And so Yahweh becomes known as the cloud rider. He's the one that rides on the clouds. No one, there's no one like Yahweh that, that rides on the clouds. So when you get to Daniel 7 and it says, Here's someone coming on the clouds. You go, that's Yahweh, but wait a minute, he looks like a man. So don't let anyone ever tell you that the concept of, of the Father and the Son or the Trinity is an exclusively New Testament doctrine. No, it's a very Jewish, biblical, Old Testament concept. Don't let anyone tell you the idea of, well, the Messiah is not divine, you know, this type. No, it's the idea that Yahweh would also appear in the form of like a man. So when Jesus, and then he's given power, dominion, and authority, and he's going to rule all the nations, and, you know, like this is the fulfillment of everything that the prophets have been building. So when Jesus comes along and says he's the son of man, he's making a vic. And how do we know, by the way? Because most of the Old Testament comes up to us in Hebrew. A few small portions are in Aramaic, including Daniel 7. And so, and tell me if I have this right, in Hebrew, son of man is ben Adam. In Aramaic, it's bar Anasha. Bar Anasha. So Jesus referred to himself as bar Anasha.